This first broadcast will go over the crystal structure of an LSD-bound human serotonin receptor. This paper was put out two years ago in 2017. Before we get into the publication, let's go over a brief history in terms of the discovery of LSD. The compound was discovered by this man, Albert Hoffman, in 1938 in Bissell, Switzerland, while he was working for Sandoz Laboratory. He created this compound from ergoin derivatives, which naturally occur in fungus that grows in rye. In 1943, he had a hunch about the compound to resynthesize it again. During synthesis, he absorbed a small amount of it into his fingertips, and he described the feeling as the following. Affected by a remarkable restlessness combined with a slight dizziness, at home I laid down and sank into a not unpleasant intoxicated-like condition, characterized by extremely stimulated imagination. In a dreamlike state with eyes closed, I perceived an uninterrupted stream of fantastic pictures, extraordinary shapes, with intense kaleidoscope of play. After two hours, his condition faded. Three days later, he decided to take a much bigger dose of the drug, 250 micrograms, and on his bike ride home had the first ever LSD trip. This trip wasn't mild, it was a pretty intense trip as 250 micrograms we now know is about two and a half times the normal human dose. The first thing the researchers wanted to look at was how does LSD sit inside of the active site of the receptor. We can see LSD in this purple magenta color inside of the receptor serotonin 2b. You also see these ball-like structures on the outside of the drug. Because compounds are made up of electrons and held together by electrons, the electrons are always moving around and create something called an electron cloud. So it's really an more accurate depiction of what the compound looks like. And it displays the tug and pull effect that the drug feels on the receptor. Now in general, any drug has an effect because it binds to a receptor. That receptor changes shapes and that unique shape conformation change is what causes the drug to have an effect. For example, this site on the receptor is also where serotonin binds. But we know that serotonin does not cause a psychedelic trip as LSD does because they are causing the receptor to change into different unique conformations. So now let's take a look at the panel B. Panel B is just a zoomed in version of panel A. It is showing us the interactions that LSD is having with the receptor. The first interaction we notice is with this NH group. It is interacting with glycine 221 on the fifth helix. The next interaction is with the nitrogen on the upper part of the molecule. Note that this is just a nitrogen because it is attached to three different R groups already. It is having an interaction with the spartic acid 135 on the third helix. We should also note that this part of the molecule, the ring part, the ergotylene part of the structure, it doesn't rotate at all because it has a bunch of double bonds. We call this sterically strained, meaning it's very rigid and hard to rotate. But the one part of the molecule that can freely rotate is the diethylamide moiety, which we'll see later has some really interesting effects. Panel C is what happens if we take that image and rotate it 90 degrees, looking down on the drug inside the receptor. LSD embedded within it has serotonin. So early researchers thought that LSD might bind to the same site as serotonin because it also has this serotonin scaffold within it. Lastly, ergotamine is a drug that occurs naturally in nature which is actually what Albert Hoffman first synthesized LSD from. Notice the structural similarities. The only difference is the upper nitrogen just has a different R group. It has two ethyl groups as opposed to this massive R group. The researchers then wanted to look at what does LSD versus ergotamine looked like in the active site of the receptor. The first thing we notice here is LSD is in the purple magenta color. Overlaid with it is ergotamine in the green color. The first thing we notice is that LSD is hydrogen bound to glycine 221 on the fifth helix. 
This is different in terms of the amine of ergotamine. This amine is going to interact with 3-onine-140 on the third helix. We can think about this much like a door hinge as the bottom left graphic is displaying. As the R group gets bigger or heavier, much like a door hinge, the molecule can swing down deeper into the pocket of the receptor versus a smaller R group, it can swing up or out of the receptor, exhibiting different binding poses inside of the receptor. The next idea that's quite interesting is that LSD changes the orientation of three amino acids, methionine, glutamic acid, and threonine. Because these amino acids have single bonds, they can rotate in what are called rotomers. It is in fact this rotation in three-dimensional space that is going to contribute to how LSD binds to the receptor versus ergotamine. We should also notice that because ergotamine has a large R group, it's going to push down on methionine 218 when it is bound inside of the receptor. The researchers then want to test whether or not LSD's diethylamid moiety plays into the fact that it is such a potent, powerful drug. The diethylamid moiety has a nitrogen connected by two ethyl groups, and on the lower part is connected by one carbon, a single bond, indicating that it can rotate in three-dimensional space, creating what are called rotomers, as we talked about before. LSD in yellow, upon binding to the receptor in purple, rotates by 60 degrees. In the panel to the right of this, we see this from a top-down view. And in B, we just see that the rotomers can rotate in space, causing these different orientations. We can test whether or not this compound's diethylamide moieties play into the fact that it is so potent and powerful. If we'll notice, the nitrogen is connected to the two ethyl groups, or arms we can think about them as. And those arms are pointing in opposite directions of one another. Using organic chemistry, we can synthesize a compound called SSAZ in which we force those arms into the same orientation in space as LSDs. Furthermore, we can make a compound called RRAZ in which we force those arms into the opposite configuration as LSDs. If the diethylamide moiety's orientation in three-dimensional space is so important in terms of its potency and efficacy, Making this change should drastically reduce the activity of the drug. Furthermore, we can choose not to make any substitutions in terms of the arms and see whether or not that affects the potency of the drug in a compound called LSA. It turns out we can actually test the activity of the drug with something called beta arrestin 2 recruitment. When you bind any drug, or most drugs, to a G-protein coupled receptor, there are cellular signaling pathways that occur upon binding. One of these is beta arrestin recruitment. We should know that there are many cellular signaling pathways that are activated upon binding. This is just one of them that we can easily, readily measure. What we'll notice is that LSD and SSAZ in panel D have about the same exact curve. We should note that the further the curve is shifted left and up, the more potent and efficacious the drug is. Because these drugs have a very similar curve, we would think that the activity of them is very similar, and we do see that in the assay. If we look at RRAZ in red, the compound to the right of it, a rightward shift indicates that there is a loss in potency of the drug. And this is where we force the arms into opposite direction as LSD and SSAZ. Furthermore, if we take away the arms as in LSA in orange, we can see the curve shifts even further rightward, indicating a greater loss in potency of the drug. There are other cellular signaling pathways that we can measure. One of these is called GQ calcium flux, and it shows a very similar result both LSD and SSAZ having similar activity. And then for RRAZ and LSA, there's a drop-off in activity. 
we can actually measure which one of these pathways is preferentially preferred in something called bias agonism or functional selectivity. This is the pathway that is preferred. We can figure this out by which one is producing stronger effects at a lower dose. And in fact, because the curves in GQ Cal's influx are shifted further to the right in terms of the log scale, we would say that because these compounds are producing stronger effects at beta arrestin 2 recruitment, they are beta arrestin bias or display functional selectivity towards beta arrestin. The next idea the researchers looked into was the idea that when LSD binds to the receptor, there is a lid that forms over it that keeps it stuck inside of the receptor, which would explain why it has such a long mechanism of action. But they wanted to test this. If we'll notice in panel B in purple, LSD is inside of the receptor, and there is this lid labeled EL2 over the receptor. This is an extracellular part of the receptor that is covering the drug. We can see in the picture to the right that LSD covers the binding pocket in the crystal structure. LSD would be inside if they're trapped by the extracellular lid. To the picture even further to the right, we can see that this lid occasionally moves in dynamic simulations. In panel E, they're trying to show us that in wild type serotonin 2B receptor, the idea here being that they don't change anything about it. At the 209th position, there is a leucine amino acid. This leucine causes the lid to not fluctuate a lot, but it does move a little bit. If you take that leucine and mutate it to alanine at the 209th position, the lid fluctuates even more, indicating that this leucine is very much needed for LSD to be stuck inside the receptor, versus if we were to change it to alanine, it would get kicked out more readily. And it turns out we can actually mutate this position on the receptor in order to test whether or not this theory is true. What this graph is trying to show us on the x-axis, we have time in minutes, and on the y-axis, 3H LSD bound drug. Essentially, it's trying to show us the fact that when you mutate the receptor that is in red, that it gets kicked out of the receptor, the drug, much quicker than if you leave the receptor wild type as is. We can see that the off rate of the line in black is much slower than the off rate of the line in red. This is showing us that LSD has a much longer time inside of the receptor before it gets kicked out. We can actually measure this in a similar manner as we measured before with beta arrestin recruitment. So what the researchers did in panel G in the first panel was to bind LSD to serotonin 2B receptor and measure its activity, but they used two different receptors. Notice how in black it says 5-HT2B and in red it says L209AEL2. That is the mutated receptor. The effect of the drug should not be as strong in the mutated receptor because it's getting kicked out much quicker than it would with wild type LSD and thus we see a much more potent and efficacious effect with wild type 5-HD2B. If we go one panel to the right, we see GQ calcium flux. We'll notice that in this case, the wild type is actually producing less end effects than the mutated receptor, but it's not by much. We can also measure this in another pathway called GQ PI hydrolysis which would cleave out water as hydrolysis would denote. We can see that the effect of the drug is very similar. In terms of potency, the L209, which is the mutated receptor, is going to have a slightly lessened effect than the 5-HT2B wild type, which is the unaffected non-mutated receptor. The last thing the researchers looked at was would it matter at different time points if we measured the activity of the drug? in wild type serotonin 2B receptor and mutant serotonin 2B receptor. Let's draw our attention to panel D in the upper left-hand corner. We'll notice there are different time points for when they took 
measurements in the assay beta arrest and tube recruitment. We do know this from taking LSD that it does take quite a while for us to feel the effects of the drug. This is because it takes a while for the drug to go through our bodies and attach to the receptor. So if we expose the drug to longer time activating the receptor, we should have stronger effects. We'll notice how five minutes is labeled black and that has the least amount of effect or the least potency all the way to 300 minutes in pink, which has the strongest effect and potency in the wild type receptor. Notice how the 2A wild type receptor and 2B wild type receptor are basically showing the similar idea that the longer the time you wait to run the assay, the stronger the effect of the drug becomes. Because as we talked about when you take LSD, it does take about 90 minutes to feel the effects of the drug. Let's go down to the next panel labeled 5-HT2A. This is the mutant type, L229AEL2. We'll notice that with longer exposure times in our assay from five minutes to 300 minutes, the efficacy and potency of the drug does not go up that much because it is easy for the drug to escape out of the receptor. In summary, we saw that LSD's potency and efficacy can be attributed to two ideas that we talked about in the publication. It's diethylamide moiety. We saw that when we play with the diethylamide moiety, changing the orientation of the diethylamide moiety arms or the two ethyl groups, we can either preserve the effect of the drug or we can reduce the effect of the drug. Then we saw the extracellular lid that covers LSD is responsible for its long mechanism of action.